welcome to The Extra Dimension. This episode is a series of conversations from NerdCon Stories 2016. I'm your host, Ian R. Buck, and I will be introducing each of my guests as they come on. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED18. So first off, uh, I should probably talk about what the heck NerdCon is. Uh, So NerdCon is a convention that was born from a conversation between Hank Green and Patrick Rothfuss. Um, Last year, 2015, was the first time that it happened, uh, and this this year was the the follow-up. Both years it was in Minneapolis, Minnesota, at the Minneapolis Convention Center. And the whole point of it is to celebrate storytelling in all mediums. So not just uh, you know authors, but also podcasters, video makers, um, puppeteers, all sorts of things. And last year I had a blast with it, and I recorded a, an episode of the Extra Dimension talking about it. But I recorded that after the fact, um, like a, it's probably a few days later, I guess, uh, in a studio. And this year I, I thought, you know, hey, why don't I just bring a microphone with me to the convention so that I can, like, record my thoughts on the ground right after, like, the panels and stuff. Uh, and then, like, halfway through the day, I suddenly realized that there are all these other really cool people to talk to. Not just, like, the, the featured guests, but also the other participants, the people who were there for the convention. Uh, you know, the, there are lots of people who are going to things that I couldn't go to. Uh, and, and, you know, there are probably people having like awesome experiences that I, that I wasn't going to know about. Um, so I did this crazy thing. I made myself a little sign that said, tell me about your day. And I just sat down with my microphone, uh, at a table in one of like the, the main hallways that everybody has to walk through to, to get from one panel to another. And, uh, and I had people come up to me and we just, we just had conversations and it was really cool. And so, yeah, so I, I, put together uh some of the more interesting parts of those conversations there there was only one microphone so i i stuck that next to the to the people who i was talking to so my voice is going to be a little bit quiet in in these um in these recordings uh so just bear with me there so most of the conversations that i had were focusing on stuff that we did and experienced there at nerdcon but of course, uh, being that some of the conversations went on for a while. For example, the first person that I talked to on, on the first day, we ended up just talking for two hours. And, and of course, that conversation kind of meandered. So I took some of the interesting conversations that I had that didn't have to do with NerdCon, and I'm putting those in a second episode. So there's going to be two episodes being published, one right after the other. Uh, this one is The Extra Dimension number 18. It's all about NerdCon. The next one, The Extra Dimension 19, that's going to be about uh, some of the interesting off-topic conversations I had with people at NerdCon. So let's get right into it. I discovered that a lot of people that I talked to had some common themes that they talked about, so I'm going to organize this episode by those topics and not by person. Uh, So I'll just mention who it is that I'm talking to before I play their clip. So first up... I talked to people about why they came to NerdCon, what what attracted them to come in the first place, which was uh, pretty darn informative because NerdCon is very different from most conventions, and so the crowd that we got uh, was was quite different as well. First up here, I have Tyler Zobel, who is also from the Twin Cities area. I came here uh, last year. I'm not really a con goer. I do identify as a pretty nerdy person, but I, I still watch a lot of YouTube. But I used to watch a lot of YouTube, and it's hard to be on YouTube and not know about John and Hank. Right. So um, I knew about John and Hank, and then I heard they were doing a convention here mm-hmm. uh, last year, obviously. So that was very interesting. Obviously, a cool idea. There's not a lot of like big mid- Midwest cons, especially by big name people. It's all West Coast, East Coast kind of stuff. So hearing that it was here was cool, and then. Uh, on top of that, that it was about stories c- centrally and not like, uh, like Marvel's and showing up and Disney. Right. <laughs> it's not a big advertisement, um, which at least uh, as a third party, it looks like a lot of big conventions are. Yeah. So it, it sounded different from the get go, and that it was very attractive to me. And I, I, I'm not like hardcore fans of them, right. like nerd fighter level, 
but I, I had watched their videos and mm -hmm. I knew that they were cool guys. So I was like, okay, that sounds interesting. So yeah, either that or like, welcome to Night Vale fans, right? Uh, and that is me. <laughs> that is definitely me. Um, so that was an added plus of like, oh, the Night Vale people are in town. But I, I went to I went to film school here in Minneapolis okay. uh, for two years. So story, obviously, and where stories come from and how you write them and things like that are definitely interesting to me. Um, I don't do a whole ton in film, at least professionally. I kind of dabble in weird artistic stuff. Okay. But um, that is definitely the draw. Weird artistic stuff is what's going yeah, on here awesome. at this convention, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and then I don't remember when I started listening. I probably started listening to podcasts a lot, probably a year or two ago, with Night Vale. That was like the first podcast I heard because it was narrative. Um, and I had listened to like audiobooks and stuff. So like, oh, I didn't know a lot about podcasts. But hearing it was like narrative, that was cool. And that was this kind of weird sci-fi comedy thing, yeah. which Night Vale is. So that was appealing to me. So then I started listening to a lot of podcasts. And uh, what I really liked about NerdCon this year is like there's a lot of podcasting yeah. themed stuff. Right. Exactly. And down to um, the fact that the guys from the Chicago Improv are here, mm -hmm. which I just a few months ago started listening to um, Hello from the Magic Tavern okay. and listened to the entire thing up to now, like within the last month. Wow. So yeah, the fact that a lot of um, I'm blanking on his name, Matt Young, plays he plays a crazy wizard on that podcast, and he's here with the Chicago Improv guys. Up next, I have Jean, whose last name I unfortunately did not catch before she ran off, but she had one of the coolest reasons to come to NerdCon uh, of anybody that I talked to. So I'll let her tell you about that. It was really specific. I mean, I knew about it because you know everybody knows about. Hank and John, but um, I also am a Find the Starlight person, so Darren Ross okay. was here, and he, he was here for that. I believe that was what they originally asked him here for, but, you know, he also does the Super Fight, and he's got another one now, Red Flags, and Business Panda, or some other, I mean, and they just keep coming, right? He's, but specifically, I came here last year hoping, because the Find the Starlight story had been sort of slow, slowly, not really unfolding. Is that, is that an augmented reality game? It's, it... it's like an online story that is unfolding, and he's got a bunch of followers. We're all out and about across the universe. And, um, yeah, and so it started with just leaving clues and things like that. And, um, you know, there's a good, a good number of people, maybe a core group of 10 or 15 people that we try to keep in touch and... You know, so last year he came here and so actually, it, yeah, like yes, wow. and it paid off. I mean, he had a couple of, like he did some illustrations that were really nice, and um, he hit them in a, a, a box at somebody else's table, down at one of the merch tables, at down the at the convention, okay. and we had to follow some clues <laughs> to figure it out. So he put something together, just a little piece of something together for us. So that was exciting. Yes, absolutely. And we found some new people to, you know, to get in. Yeah, and so he's given out um, four medallions uh, so far this, in the last two days. And I found two of the people. I don't know where the other two are. But so, but this year I also came uh, because Zach Sally is here. And so he's from town and he's a comic artist and um, he's a musician. But I just really wanted to see him and see if I could get some of his older books. And they, sure enough, they were here. So it's really cool. I get to see him. Signed all my books. I bought like five Zach Sally comics. So that was pretty awesome, too. You know, this con, you know, you can say it about and pretty much any con you might go to. But this is truly, the people here are way different. Uh, yeah. <laughs> way well, different than... That's my understanding. Yeah, like... Yeah. It attracts a whole different it's crowd. completely unlike anything else I've ever been to. So it's really good. Really nice people, really thoughtful people. Everybody respects everybody else. It's outstanding. And everybody's really thoughtful too. So um, things unfold and you get way more than you expect when you when you show up. I am, I'm from Minneapolis, yeah. But are you? Cool. Yeah, it's good. I mean, 
there's a lot of people from town here, but there's people from everywhere here. It's been pretty interesting to meet faces. And yeah, I think part of the reason that we have so many people from in town is because we don't have a lot of conventions. Mm -hmm. That are like uh, that are good like this. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we might have the whatever the cons that come through every town, but quality, you know, unique like this, for real, it's pretty cool. Oh my god. And I mean, we're repping. We've got good people from here in town too. It's that's been another thing that's really made me happy. So not necessarily traditional writers like Dessa is here, you know, yeah. and and Zach Sally too. I mean, so comics, music, spoken word, just all this stuff. It's like very cool to have representation. People that I'm extremely proud of that are from my hometown that are here and are you know actively participating in it. So. Now, once at NerdCon, one of the things that people love so much about it is that it is a smaller convention, which allows you to go up to the featured guests and, and have conversations with them uh, after panels and stuff like that. So, here to talk about that is Matt Letter. There's so much cool stuff, and, and actually one of my favorite parts about this is talking to the performers, not the performers, but like the guest speakers. Um, after and in the hallways yeah. and kind of getting their take on it. I love that this is a little bit of a smaller convention so you can get kind of walk up to people and chat with them. I chatted with one of the um, creators of Cards Against Humanity. Hey, yeah, like, yeah. You can just do that sort of thing here. It's really cool. I just uh, was in a puppetry workshop and I got talking to some of the uh, speakers there about all, like their, some of their experiences with puppets and the things that they've been working on and, and it's just really really cool because they've been they've worked at things that I've seen uh -huh. but especially in that sort of format you wouldn't know it because it's puppets you, you right. would never see the person behind it but um, like the Adventures Club in Disney World you'd never see these, you know some of these different shows um, and you get to kind of chat with them about like what were their experiences with that and, and yeah and they were very generous with their time. Now, of course, sometimes the featured guests are not the only ones that you want to meet and get to know at a convention like this. Uh, so here is Liz Noterman, who made a few new friends at NerdCon. I went to the, the feminist book okay. uh, symposium, if you want to call it that. And it was round table setting, so there was a bunch of tables in the room. Okay. Um, which was actually really great um, because I got to talk to all of the, it was of course all girls at my table, though there were men in the room, which was very impressive. Um, but the, the speaker came and sat at our table and joined in our conversation with us. So that was, that was pretty fun, actually. So um, we've all agreed that we're going to use each other to like bounce ideas off of, so we exchanged emails. And so, yeah, so I met a, eight people that I'm going to be keeping in touch with. That's pretty cool. Now, even though most of the people that I talked to were from the Twin Cities area, uh, Thad Fediplace managed to meet a few people from a little bit farther out and, uh, and kept in touch with them. We met someone here, actually a few people. We sat at those the tables were all kind of full. And so there was a guy sitting there and he had a little sign up saying, you know, come talk to me or whatever. I can't remember exactly. I'm like, well, why not? This guy seems you know, nice enough, and we had a conversation, and there was some, a couple other people at the table that we had come from Australia, they were like on wow. vacation, and they just decided to pop into NerdCon, didn't know anything about it, I think, we got talking to them, when I first put my book out online, uh -huh. the woman that we met at the table was, she was one of the best people as far as going on and reading the book and get, providing feedback, and uh -huh. like, not just like, I think this is great, but... Uh, you know, you had this uh, grammatical error here, or I, I think you could, you know, handle this particular description better, or this is a little bit confusing. I mean, the kind of stuff I want. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not one of those people who just wants this, like, pat on the back, oh, I love what you wrote. Right. I want to know if I'm actually connecting and if, you know, people are having any sort of problems with what I read, if, if there's things that need to change. And sometimes it's hard to find that sort of critical feedback. Yeah. There's a lot of people that are really hesitant. They don't want to be rude, you know? It's yeah, like, <laughs> especially here in Minnesota. Yeah. So, so that was something really that nice came out of, out. yeah, that, that's something that came out of NerdCon last year is one of the most helpful, uh, you know, 
proofreaders or whatever. Not even that. More of like a, some of the best feedback I got was from someone I met here at Intercon. Now, as cool as all of these stories are, the next one from Jeff Adams definitely takes the cake, and I on purposely saved it for last. So, came all the way to come to this con, wasn't exactly sure what was here. The panels were great, the coffee catch was great, but earlier today I went to a panel on uh, storytelling and music. A little different vibe, some, some people I guess are famous in like the local music scene or the Midwestern music scene. I'm old. So I didn't know these guys. The one guy I did know was Kevin McLeod. He's like famous for creating scores, instrumental music to be used in videos and podcasts, and made the decision to give this stuff away. And he's making a very nice living doing that through donations that people like I give him, iTunes sales and whatnot. So I really was nerding out and wanted to, you know, meet Kevin McLeod and give him a check because I run the Icebox Radio Theater, a podcast in International Falls. We've used his music quite a bit. Uh-huh. And he, his thing is literally just give me a donation and, and that's it. Uh, whatever you want, whatever, however much you've used, there's no price scale. Yeah. Except what, if you, what you think is reasonable, right? Right, right. Yeah. E- except if you wanted a piece of music that you wanted to be wholly yours that no one else can use. Then he, then he charges, like, standard rates. Sure. So Kevin McLeod and I said hi. And there was another guy there who did a, who has a YouTube channel that was thanking him for a similar thing. And then we started chatting. And then we started chatting. And then we go outside because he wanted to have a smoke cigarette. And I came with him. And we're still talking. And then we, you want to sit down. There's a bench. So we sat down. And he really wanted to go back to his hotel room and have a drink because he's, he's performing here in about 10, 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. Um, at the main stage? Yeah, at the okay. main stage. He'll be doing, like I guess, scoring a live something or other. A little nervous about it. I got that sent. Anyway, it was a two-hour conversation about internet, life, why do I, you know, I, we both had the similar experience, him obviously on a much higher scale, of I create, people seem to like it, make a little money doing it, yet there's something lacking, which is in a sense is really depressing because if Kevin McLeod feels this way... That means something. He, with no trace of irony, he mentioned he is probably the most heard composer in the world right now. Yeah. Just in terms of ears on his music. We're talking not Bach, not the Beatles, <laughs> no one like that. It's just Kevin McLeod. It was like two and a half hours. And I don't, I don't know. In a sense, it was, it was nice because, like I said... He struggled with a lot of the, some of the same things. Obviously, not in the same level. Right. But it is this sense where, well, for a musician, for example, you would you'd go somewhere and you'd you get a career going, and then the the industry would like kind of take over part of it and guide you and maybe not necessarily control what projects you work on but have an input, mm-hmm. and all of this stuff was I like, taking care of, and now everyone is doing it themselves. Yeah. So it's this constant, am I doing this right, am I doing this right? Because he was talking about, I'm really not out there too much on Twitter and other social media, should I be doing that? And I'm like, why the hell would you be doing that? You're making a living. Yeah. <laughs> you're making a living at, uh, at doing what you're doing. Why change a thing that's working out right? But right. that's the thing, right? You know, there, there's no, when do the chicks come around? That's really what it comes down to. When, when do I get my mansion? And nobody does that anymore. And that's why you come to NerdCon, right? That's yeah. why you come to anything like this. Holy shit. You don't shit. know what's going to happen. Right? <laughs> I feel like we're friends now. I don't know. I, I don't know. Anyway, so when I saw this, I said, oh, perfect. I'm going to sit down and tell Ian about that. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Kevin McLeod, I can guarantee that all of you have heard at least one of his songs because I've been using it as the interlude uh, in between sections in this podcast. Oh, look, here it comes again. Now, you may have noticed that podcasts came up quite frequently in my conversations with people, and I think there are two reasons for that. Number one is that podcasts had a pretty strong showing at NerdCon uh, last year, 2015. Welcome to Night Vale was there. And this year, we had a lot of different podcasters, including Ben Acker and Ben Blacker from the Thrilling Adventure Hour, and also the Chicago Podcast Collective was there. 
but also because I had people sitting down in front of a microphone, and so they were aware that this stuff that they were saying was going to go up on a podcast, which of course naturally meant that people were thinking about podcasts while they were talking to me. Uh, So first up here, I have Thad again, who is uh, an author, uh, writes novels, um, and he was thinking about making those into audiobooks uh, and also about podcasting as a storytelling medium. Well, like with my uh, writing, I've really been thinking about making audiobooks. And one of the things that's motivated me is my father has Parkinson's and he also has glaucoma and had like some botched glaucoma surgery. And his vision is like horrible now. Okay. Um, and so reading is just a real challenge for him in, in a lot of ways. So I thought, well, you know, that's something, he, but he is, his hearing is fine. Uh, and I had been reading aloud to him. Like when I'd visit, I would read a few chapters of my book to him. But then that was limited only when I was there. I'm like, well, okay, you know what? I, you know, I'm just going to read my my book myself, make my own audio book for my dad, put it online if other people want it. Great. Um, and so that's really got that right there was my end to this whole the auditory, uh, you know, way of doing things the whole life. And that's and that they got me thinking about that podcasts and and all sorts of stuff like that. So so yeah. There's this whole new world opening up. I've always been about the written word. That was me. I was a writer, so that's what I sought out. And yeah, I think out of mm-hmm. all of the mediums, the closest one to just written text on a page, I think, is just mm-hmm. listening to a person speak the words. Right? Sure, sure. Um, and you can do a few more things, like you know, putting yeah. sound effects, and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, at certain times if you've got mm-hmm. a higher production, you know, value. Uh, yeah. An audiobook. Well, that's but, that's. But it's not mm-hmm. necessary, right? Sure. You can sure. just do it. Yeah, you can have some great ones where you get, you know, the author or someone like Will Wheaton or whoever, you know, mm-hmm. reads it, and that kind of adds an extra layer. I don't know if you yeah. ever listened to any of Will Wheaton doing audiobooks, have... but he, he's very expressive. Well, that's and you're right. There's, I mean, there's so much you, uh, diversity in what you can do with an audito- auditory kind of thing, where like you know, I'm my my first baby steps is going to be just reading my novel Devious Origins, mm-hmm. uh, and making a book out of it for my dad, but. Um, I, there's, we saw something, uh, was it the Racine Theater Guild? Or, no, no, it was someplace they were doing like an old-time radio show kind of thing where basically they had everyone all lined up, the various characters, and they had the sound effect. And then you, you, got to, you went in this theater and just watched the people mm-hmm. do the performance. Standing at a you know, microphone. Yeah, and, and that was your experience was you get to see the actual, see them do it. But then when they were done, they had this, this piece of artwork that then they could like put on the radio or sell and you know, mm-hmm. whatever. I, I'm not sure what they did with it afterwards, but... Um, so that that was really neat. And that, I actually, was, I've thought about that. That would be kind of fun thing to do is like that extra layer of, you know, have it voiced with multiple people, put in the sound effects. Like, could I take, do an adaptation of some of the things I've written where you basically kind of maybe take out some of the, uh, the narrative um, or the descriptive uh, kind of narrative uh, and replace it then with with uh, you know the the sound effects and with uh-huh. the stuff like that. You know, yeah. kind of how how what would be the challenge of reworking it into something like that? So. Mm-hmm. I also got to discuss some of the differences between making video and, and making podcasts with Tyler. So you went to the independent podcasters panel, I imagine? Yes, I did. Yeah. I went to a lot of the podcasting-centric yeah. ones, yeah. Because I, like, I started in video, um, obviously with the film background, but um, the uh, I, I, video is still very interesting to me, but it's hard to, it's hard to make a video. It takes a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You can do it with one person, yeah. but it's tough. So if, especially it takes if you, a lot of time. Time, money, if you want to make something narrative, you need actors and stuff. Again, that's, that's definitely still a passion of mine. But the podcast thing was something I enjoyed, but it's now... And it, I, a lot of help from hearing stuff in these panels of this con. Uh, it's a good alternative. Be, not alternative, but a, a side project and something I'm interested in kind of trying mm-hmm. myself. Um, because it's easier to just talk yeah. <laughs> than have to have a camera. Uh, you can you don't have to be in the same room. I started a podcast with one of my old um, roommates. It's just us talking about like movies and stuff we would already talk about. We're just recording it basically. But he moved to Virginia, but we can still do it because we're over Skype, so he doesn't need to be there. Um, you don't have to worry about like the video quality. No, I can that. I don't. I can be in my pajamas, or we can do it at like eight o'clock at night and look terrible or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's interesting, and I'm interested in even trying. Again, it's a little more complicated than just having a conversation podcast, but some sort of narrative thing because I really like Hello from the Magic Tavern, which is kind of improv and narrative, um, uh, Night Vale, which is written narrative, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So, now one of the favorite things that I heard about podcasts all day was from Matt. That's uh, that's one of my main areas of passion. 
is how do you incorporate technology into art? There you go. So podcasting is a perfect intersection of that mm -hmm. for me. But Matt also liked to keep things well balanced. I love having those focused things about like this is my core interest. Let's you know tell me about what I can do to improve, what I can focus on. Um, what are some cool stories about that? But I also love just going into something that I have no idea about. Yeah. Because it's always interesting here. It's so fantastic. So let's branch out a little bit from podcasting to other subjects. First up, Tyler's going to tell us what attracted him to the panels. It feels, it's, this sounds dry and boring, but it feels educational in a good way, in that I go to panels to learn something, not to be, like, told news about a product. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, they obviously, they're pitching their new books and stuff, but they're, we're not learning about their new book, if they're an author. Uh -huh. We're learning about their process, or how they wrote that book, or how they get over stress, or, like, things about being an artist, or a writer, or a musician. It's about their perspective as an artist, not their perspective on the thing they're making, like, their new title. <laughs> yeah, so like it's it's the kind of thing where you're going to become interested in a person's new book if you're interested in what they have to say during the panel, right? right? As opposed to like, okay, there's this cool new trailer that just brought exactly Who's exactly at this convention. Yeah. Unfortunately, not all of the panels provided what the audience was expecting. Here's Liz. My first one was um, mental health in young adult novels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it wasn't exactly what I was hoping it was going to be, but it was very informative. It was long. She read long passages from four books that deal with young adult mental health. Okay. And then she read from a couple of essays that people posted on her website. Um, I would like to write a young adult novel. Actually, I'd like to write a young adult series. And the character that I want to write about uh, has suffered um, an injury that prevents her from doing gymnastics anymore. Okay. So that's obviously going to cause some depression when she cannot do that anymore, like this whole thing she's been training for her entire life. So I was kind of hoping to have more of a, like, this is where you go to get the right, like, the resources you need to be able to write this the right way, as opposed to just, like, this is why mental health issues are important in young adult books. Do you get, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I wanted more information on how to. Anybody who's going to be going to the event is already mm -hmm. agreeing with you that it's an important thing to talk about, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. So that was slightly disappointing. Um, I kind of wish I had gone to after being in there and just hearing her talk for an hour, I was thinking I would have been maybe more beneficial to have gone to the one about voice, like the voice of the author versus the voice of the character, because okay. those are the two I was debating between. And so in hindsight, I kind of wish I had gone to that one, partly because they were right next door and they sounded like they were having so much fun, yeah. but also because I felt like I just didn't learn anything in that, mm. in that first one. But it wasn't bad. It was just not what I had been hoping for. Sure. Another panel that several people went to who I talked to was the How to Self-Promote panel. And I think lots of us went there because we were hoping to learn more about what to do to get the word out about the stuff that we make. Uh, but unfortunately, most of the panelists who were there also wanted to learn about how to do that from the other panelists. So it was a, a little bit disappointing. I did the uh, how to self-promote. I went to that one as well. Yep. Right? That was, like, they set up their expectations really low at the beginning. Really low. <laughs> like, I don't think I really got anything helpful out of this one, except for entertainment value. Like, really. Yeah. Except for I now have reopened my Twitter account, which I haven't touched since I was a teacher, and I used to get tweets from celebrities that were terrible and have my students correct the grammar. <laughs> and that was the one where we heard a bunch of laughing from the next room over. Yes. Was like, man, they were having a good time. They sound like they were having a blast. Yeah. Like, not that we didn't have fun, but like I said, when the most I got out of there is I should read, you know, boot up my Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, there were a couple things that I was like, okay, so I'm not crazy for doing this thing. Like what? Um, like, uh, oh no, wait, actually, that was in a different podcast. So one, okay. of the, one of the people in a different panel said, like, 
Yeah, I have like, you know, my regular Twitter account and then we've got the Twitter account for like, you know, the action, the podcast yeah. itself. And I have conversations with myself <laughs> between those two accounts and I'm like, I'm not the only one. Oh, <laughs> I would totally do that too. Yeah. Um, uh, but like, uh, I don't know, they, they did bring up like having a newsletter. Okay, that seems like a good idea. It, sounds, it seems really dumb, but yeah. it's... Probably but like, if you have a website and you update it regularly, isn't that kind of a newsletter? Kind of, yeah. Um, I guess it's more just like the going to people where they are as opposed to expecting them, them to, to come, come to you. your website. That's um, true. Yeah, like if I had some like feeds on the actual website, then people could subscribe to those in like an RSS reader. And, you know, yes. but then not everybody uses RSS readers, then everybody uses email, but not everybody checks their email. And it's, yeah. It is a nightmare. Yeah. Why can't I just beam the stuff directly into the brains of people who are interested? There was one person there who seemed to know what she was doing in terms of self-promotion, though, and that was one of the members of the audience who, at every single panel that I was at, that she was also at, she stood up at the end to ask a question and managed to also tie in a plug for her podcast at the same time. Uh, and she was also leaving a bunch of uh, flyers and you know pieces of paper out in the common areas for people to take. So uh, I'm sure that... Uh, that she acquired a lot of new listeners over the weekend. Now, being at a convention it can be very overwhelming, so quite a few people, when I asked them uh, about what they had been doing, they just kind of gave me, like, blank stares for a moment uh, while they tried to remember what the heck they had been doing over the last 12 hours. For example, Matt. Gosh, it's been a really, really long few days. It has. <laughs> Whew. Oh I, boy! I was amazed when I was talking to somebody last night, and they were like, "Yeah, what? What did you go to?" And I'm like, "You know, goodness." <laughs> there was stuff. People talked. It was great. <laughs> Now, one of the really awesome things about going to NerdCon is all of the in-jokes that come out of it. So, for example, last year during one of the uh, main stage events, there was a guacamole combined with Illuminati character thing uh, that was created, and so that became the guacanati, and immediately the crowd created like a, a hand symbol for it which was like making a triangle with your fingers in front of in front of your your face uh th there were shenanigans with the asl interpreter guy who broke down laughing so hard during one of the uh one of the shows that uh everybody got to know him pretty well and, and actually he had uh a, I, th I believe he had an autograph line going uh because people swarmed him after that show because they they thought he was so funny um, this year, they started some of the in-jokes before the convention even started because uh, Maureen Johnson, who was supposed to be there as a featured guest, couldn't make it. So she asked everybody on Twitter to wear name tags that said Maureen Johnson on them before, uh, before everybody got to the convention. And, uh, and things just kind of got crazier from there this year. So to talk about that, I have Tyler and then Liz. Like, there's these big stage shows that kind of anchor everybody in and everybody's in it. And everybody's sharing these, like, in-jokes about the sign language guy or the guacanati or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It, yeah, I don't know. It's strange. We need some of these to become, like, proper internet memes. Not just stuff yeah. that we know about. And, like, my pseudo-hipster, like, little <laughs> fraction of me, it makes me wish, like, no one else learns it. Like, I want this yeah. to just be the That's in. True. It, it feels like an, it, it's right? an in-crowd. Super fight. That was fantastic. Oh my god, I haven't laughed that hard in a long time. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if they did Super Fight last year or not. Uh, I think they did, because yeah, that's where Guacanati came from, right? Okay. Yeah. I must have missed Super Fight last year, I think but. I did um, too. But Marie, right? Uh, Mary, Marie. The, the one who was here today. Yes. Yeah, that was On me. the right. Yeah. Whatever she did last year, there was some like tavern game. Yeah. She was fantastic uh, in that. The stories of Baron von something. something. Yes, that yeah, one. Yeah. That was fantastic. And she just lived up to that. It was great. Um, yeah, I remember how uncomfortable Hank got like sitting next to her last year. <laughs> well, I think uh, everyone got a little bit uncomfortable with her in the room this year um, with the. Uh, yeah, the whole orgasming all oh, the time yeah. part. She did it very well, though. But 
Yeah, um, I loved that. I loved how we broke David again this year. Yeah. <laughs> I think if, if there's any reason to keep NerdCon going, it's, it's for so David. David can come back and <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm, I'm just waiting for when he actually becomes an internet meme. Yeah. Because he's fantastic. We broke the interpreter multiple times this year, too. It was, yeah. And she, um, not, what did she say her name was? The female interpreter? Uh, did they say her name? They did. Um, I believe it started with an N. But she was pretty great too. I felt bad for her rubber duck song, but she was she was into that. Um, this probably sounds really weird to anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about. Um, one of the uh, participants sang rubber ducky seductively, and so the interpreter had to sign rubber ducky seductively, and it was very entertaining. Her entire body wiggling and. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was sassy. I've never seen Rubber Ducky sassy before. No. We have very dirty minds, us nerds. It, yeah, and yeah, those all came from the crowd. So, it did. Yeah. I really want him to do an expansion pack. That's the NerdCon Stories Edition. Yeah. Because really cool. I would purchase that. Mm -hmm. and, and then we get more exposure for the convention. Yeah. We get more people. And people would be like, what is this NerdCon thing? We'd be like, you don't even know. <laughs> we signed Vagina, <laughs> which is, you know, a pseudonym for guacamole. Yeah. And the soup thing, that was amazing how fast that caught yeah. on. What? <laughs> All of a sudden, I, I just looked up and, like, everybody in front of me was doing it. I'm the like, soup. okay. Yeah. Soup. Go. We're good. <laughs> and now we have our, our thing for this year. Now, of course, looming over everybody's heads this year was the fact that Hank had put out a video before the convention saying that they hadn't gotten as many ticket sales as they expected and they were going to lose money on the convention this year. And so the future of NerdCon is kind of unknown, kind of nebulous. And so uh, a few people who I talked to actually had suggestions for Hank on uh, on ways to either save money or or just make the convention better for next year uh, so that we can attract more people. So first up I have Peter Nixon who uh, actually volunteered at the convention this year. So this is really cool but I can't help but notice that like there could be so much more you know like more events and stuff like that you know and like so many people are like playing board games and like yeah. all around and yeah why I mean, I know stories is, is the point, but let's have more, you know? Yeah, let's like do it. Let's do it all. Yeah, let's, yeah, yeah more, yeah, let's do like, uh, like, let's do like RPG sessions, like mega games, like, uh, like comic book stuff, like, why not, man, you know? And, you know, we can, you know, we can always do story stuff too, yeah. but, yeah. Well, and it's not like there aren't stories in tabletop games and stuff like that, right? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the, uh... One of the seminars is about that, right? Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, that's that's what I got. And I mean, and it, it was it was awesome to um, be able to do an open mic and see all these other people's stories and see all these other aspiring artists, you know? Yeah, yeah it's very cool. Very cool. It's a lot of heart, you know? Mm -hmm. A lot of heart. Yeah. And I mean, there are there are smaller convention centers in yeah. in the cities, yeah, you know? Yeah. It'd be yeah. To do a cheaper day. yeah. 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 If you still want to do just the stories and stuff like that, but yeah. Hank, if you're listening to this, you need someone to plan a mega game or something like that. <laughs> Let me know. Peter Nixon, Nixon100 at umn.edu. It also came up while I was talking to Tyler. Yeah, I think the, the void of Night Vale not being here has been significant. Um, yeah. Because a lot of like a lot of the there's like a a little a little bit of celebrity status maybe has been lost. Yeah. I would say maybe. Um, there's a, you know, there's a few more authors here that weren't here last year, mm -hmm. but now like, oh, you're kind of interesting, mm -hmm. um, which is good. I mean, it's good to have right. variety. We don't want to have like all of the same people here every year. No, day. no. Um, I, th I think everybody who speaks, I found them, I find them really interesting because even if it's something I, I don't know anything about them, right. I'm learning something new then. Um, but I think last, I, d I don't know, I've heard things about this maybe the last year and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't know. I'm hoping not. I know, that fingers. seems to be the consensus is like, everybody has heard that, but nobody knows for sure. 
Well, I don't think even Hank knows for sure. Exactly. So, <laughs> like, uh, I don't know. But I think part of that thing might be um, last year you had people like Night Vale. Maybe Night Vale is more niche than I think it is. Maybe because I'm on the inside, but I feel like they were a, maybe a big draw. Seemed like it, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, last year, it seemed like maybe they. Again, have you heard the numbers? Are there less people here this year? Yeah, that's. There are. Yeah. Okay. All right. I I don't, I don't know. I guess maybe my thought was maybe it's like uh, there's more guests here this year, but they're kind of they have smaller audiences, maybe a little more a bit more niche. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. I have no idea. And it could be as something as simple as like. We can't use the Minneapolis Convention Center next year because it's too expensive. Yeah, or something, you know? <laughs> that's what I keep thinking. I'm like, Hank, Hank and John, uh, please, if you ever listen, <laughs> um, you can make it cheaper. Like, we'll still enjoy it. <laughs> like, uh, if you, if we have to have it outside, I feel like people <laughs> wouldn't mind. It, well, and I feel, I feel like there's been a like in a bunch of the panels I've been, I've been going to and stuff. The guests, the speakers, they've been talking about how much they love. The, I mean, I'm sure they say that a lot of things they go to. We're talking about how, like, the crowd here is special to them in some way. I also had another idea for improving the attendance numbers for NerdCon, uh, being that there are so many locals who go to NerdCon and that many people who are there are either teachers or librarians or are otherwise in, in education, um, or they're students, you know. It would make a lot more sense to hold NerdCon on MEA weekend, which is when we all have Thursday and Friday off. And that, is, both years, has been the weekend after the weekend that NerdCon was. So just by shifting it by one week, I, I bet that we'll have a lot more people there. Now, being that so many of the people who attended NerdCon are also small-time creators, uh, a lot of people who I talked to, we got to discussing uh, issues that uh, face creative people uh, when they're doing their work. So first up, I have Thad, who talked about trying to get the word out about uh, your work. Well, it's funny you mentioned about making cards. Um, our first day at the convention was kind of interesting for me because we got here Thursday, and I decided, oh, I want to have something I can people ask me about my book because I did I did open mic last year and people yeah. ask me what oh where do I learn more and I'm like I actually I, remember the two yeah and it's like I, I didn't really have anything I could give to people so I got the idea to do that so I Thursday night stayed up all night making those on the computer and then going to the copy center over there right. and printing them uh, and so I had two hours of sleep <laughs> before the first day of the convention and then signed up for open mic so I'm like downing coffee all day uh, until I get to the, my like 7, 7 20, uh, p.m. slot for doing my open mic. But at that point, at least I had like the adrenaline kind of hit me. I'm like, oh, I'm in front of people, I'm talking. And I basically went through and read, like a, she, she probably showed you on the back, there's the yes. Mad Scientist Wisdom. I basically read, just that, that was my open mic, because I just sat and I read all of those. Oh, and, yeah. and it was great. They laughed <laughs> at like every one. And then I was mobbed by people afterwards. We probably gave away about half those right after the open mic. One thing I've we've kind of learned it's that um, building up a following is a lot of work. It is. Uh, whether you're like a, an indie musician or a writer or a podcaster or whatever, that uh, building a following you got to put in the hours. Uh, it doesn't just like oh I put art out there and everyone discovers it and sees how brilliant I am yeah. and suddenly it, no there's a lot of really talented people out there and you, and getting yourself noticed uh, among the crowd uh, it takes a little bit. So. We've got some ideas for. Some sort of, uh, I don't know if you call it guerrilla marketing or, or whatever. And, um, I mean, today I just sort of threw together the Mad Scientist Wisdom, you know, putting a different one on the back of each of them. And, um, and that actually was kind of successful. I mean, that. that yeah, because now it's like collect them all. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind of. So it's like people are like, oh, I like what. That, this was funny. I'm going to go to his website and read the rest of it. So. Um, but I've, I've, I've had some really interesting ideas. I think about things to explore, like the, the story, uh, Devious Origins. Uh, takes place down in Louisiana. The sequel book is going to take place in, in New Orleans. And we actually, some place we like to go for the winners. So I've thought about kind of doing, and I'm, I'm maybe uh, giving this away, but maybe someone on the internet will find the <laughs> podcast and solve the mystery. I was going to like, thinking about putting up posters, like little uh, hand-printed flyers around parts of New Orleans oh, that, say, that, that say that say stuff like, uh, she protects us, have like a drawing of that character. Uh -huh. and say she protects us. And then, have like encoded around the edge in Morse code, like something that will get you to the website. But then along with that, have found footage, put found footage online mm -hmm. of the 
uh, the hero of the story because that's actually a part of in the story. There's uh, she kind of becomes this sensation because of people doing like phone captures of her being uh-huh. the hero, uh, and and put that out there without any explanation, right? And see if people start to connect viral the dots, marketing. you know, start to do the viral marketing thing. Uh-huh. So um, when people start trying to put it together, they'll find this podcast maybe, and then uh, <laughs> that'll be the thing that solves it. Uh, as far as I know, at the time that we came up with this, we were the only people that were thinking about let's apply the Google Voice API to a game. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, we thought we might actually get a, a, a little more attention just based on that. Right. Uh, but again, it's like you've got all sorts of other people doing clever things, and yeah. you know you have to try and get the world noticed. is just too darn clever, <laughs> isn't it? I know. So it's like yeah, yeah, getting noticed among all the other people doing clever <laughs> things is sometimes a, it's 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 a double edged sword. It's like great i mean this world with all this great stuff going mm-hmm. on it's like this cornucopia of interesting projects and great art and all this stuff like that but then on the same time that means when i do my stuff it makes sometimes it's harder to find the audience so mm-hmm. yeah one of the uh one of the panels they mentioned um uh imposter syndrome right where it's mm-hmm. like oh there's all these oh, people yes. who are doing awesome stuff like what am i doing i uh, i'm like nobody like i, I i'm not doing anything that's mm-hmm. worthwhile mm-hmm. um i'm just faking it and uh i just realized while we were going through this that like i don't really feel like i'm faking it with the like quote-unquote creative things that i'm doing you know mm-hmm. in my off time like podcasting sure. photography and stuff like that um i feel more like i'm faking it when it comes to computer science stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you know like i i went to college i took all the classes but like mm-hmm. um there were so many of my classmates who would like go back home from their classes and then like work on side projects and stuff sure you know mm-hmm. that are computer science related and i was never really interested in doing i i don't know if it was just a lack of ideas you sure. know that, uh, in, in my own brain but like i was more interested in like making podcast stuff yeah. and so yeah. like uh here i am with a computer science degree and it's probably a really good thing that i'm teaching yeah. high schoolers computer <laughs> stuff now because like i don't i don't know how much i would like working in computer science, mm-hmm. you know, at the Solus Corporation. That's, what, yeah. that's basically my day job. Is uh, I'm a independent consultant for big corporations uh-huh. creating various products. Right now, I'm doing software for lighting control systems, which is actually kind of an interesting project. Uh-huh. But it's like I t- took me like till I was in my 40s, or maybe in my late 30s, till I realized writing is what I really love doing. So mm-hmm. it's like now I'm kind of at that point. I'm like, okay, I still have to pay the bills. Can't stop doing the computer thing because that's actually you know. People are willing to pay me for that. Right. Uh, but I don't see myself just doing the computer thing now until I retire. It's like at some point it's like I'm going to retire from the the computer consulting. Probably still work with computers because I love writing video games. Mm-hmm. Again. But I'm hoping to get to that point where I can write video games and books and stuff like that mm-hmm. and actually make a living off that. Yeah. I made that switch where I stopped thinking of myself as a computer professional who sometimes likes to write stuff to a writer who pays the bills as a computer consultant. That's, yep. that's that was kind of that pivotal point that happened pretty much only a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And then I really started devoting some time. It was that, imp- that sort of imposter syndrome you were talking about. I never really thought about the fact that I might be good enough that people would want to read my stuff. And so I wrote mm-hmm. stuff, and I never shared it very broadly. And uh, the last few years, I've been very, had some very positive feedback on mm-hmm. putting myself out on the Internet, getting it in front of people, and, and having pretty much overwhelmingly positive feedback from people saying, this is really great, I want to read the next one, and, and stuff like that. And I wish I would have done that a lot sooner. I mean, yeah. I have like a couple of decades of writing I could have been, had done already. <laughs> and I'm very yeah. aware that I'm at that stage where it's like you, when you start writing, your, your stuff is not as good as it's going to be after you put a lot of time in. Right, so, yeah. You know, it's like, and even, and even um, not just the time that you've lost, mm-hmm. but also like mm-hmm. you're at a different point in your life now than you were right, back right. then, right? Mm-hmm. So what you're writing now is probably different than what you would have yeah. been writing right. uh, regardless I, of experience, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's two things. I mean, I definitely have more life experience to draw from, and that's a good thing. Uh, but then there's also just the craft of writing. Mm-hmm. You certainly get better at that over time. And, yeah. and I've done a, I continue to do writing over the years. It's just I'm now finally really taking it seriously and putting a lot more effort into mm-hmm. trying to improve the craft. So, right. Um, yeah. And finally, Tyler brought up an issue that uh, definitely spoke to me because this is something that uh, I have trouble with a lot. Yeah, writing definitely interests me. I don't consider myself much of a writer, but I 
would probably be okay at it if I committed to like a project. Right. I, I like I have a lot of random ideas, so I kind of you just gotta like pick one. I gotta pick one and be that. like turn turn off all the other ones and uh -huh. be like I'm gonna try this one and actually finish it as opposed to just starting it and then being like oh what about this other one. Um, but hearing that one a great panel that was here was um, one about it's called, it was called doing all the things. Okay. It was like Pat Rothfuss and. Uh, I'm blanking on all the names. Anyway, it was a bunch of people, but a lot of them were people who, for the most part, do a lot of their stuff independently. Uh -huh. So Pat Rothfuss writes novels, so he kind of sits in a room and writes his own novels. Right. And people who do a lot of their own, when they make stuff, they do most of the work. Uh -huh. So it was a lot about focusing and things I struggle with, uh, focusing on one project and not bouncing around, not like stressing out a ton, knowing how to like balance your life and sleep and yeah. getting your projects done. So that was a great panel because that really hit me, hit home for me. And a lot of the struggles those people talked about and things they have they have overcome, and wh how, how they do that, were things that I really related to. So. so that's it for the extra dimension number eighteen. Remember, please check the show notes at thenexus.tv/ted18 for links to all of my guest stuff and how to find them on Twitter and whatnot. Uh, and check out The Extra Dimension number 19, the next episode of this show, for more discussions on the Renaissance Festival, uh, a voice-controlled game demo, and various talks about podcasts, video games, and TV shows. I am Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter at Ian R. Buck uh, or my website, ianrbuck.com. Uh, we are The Nexus, so you can find us on Twitter at The Nexus TV. Uh, or send us an email at uh, thenexustv at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you around, and have a good one. <laughs>